Hey, this is the McGuire Review, and I am pleased, nay, proud to take a look at today the brand new Ennis. This is from our friends at Asmodee, and I was lucky enough to pick up a copy of this at Gen Con 2016 that I just got back from. They did release this game at Gen Con, and it will not be out on the market for retail for two to three months. So this one was... Um, released pretty early at Gen Con than what is going to hit the retail market, which is always a pretty awesome thing if you're able to pick up the game at a con like that well before it hits the retail market. So on this one, it's a 14 plus, two to four players, and 60 minutes. Now that may jump out to you immediately on that timing that it just locks it right into 60 minutes when you look at a game like this. This game and games that look like this game that have that more miniature slash epic longer gameplay feel to them usually go well over the hour mark. And what they've done so well with this game is they've given you that epic feel in the Celtic world, which is like phenomenal. I've been waiting for a game like this I don't know how long, so I couldn't be more overly excited about that. It's dripping with theme. But the mechanics that they built into the game and the way the gameplay works is very simplistic. It only has two phases. One, an assembly phase, and two, a seasons phase. My seven-year-old can play this game no problem. And all the actions are driven based on these green action cards here. So when it's your turn, and the turn cycle also changes every round due to a flip of the flock of crows coin, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, which I also is a very cool mechanic that I really like. For you to be able to actually make an action and do something, you have to have the action card in your hand to be able to do that. And I like that. It isn't like when it's your turn, oh, I'm just going to do whatever, right? I just got this list of actions that I can choose for, from every round. and I can do one, two, three, four things. Uh, I'll choose this one, or I can do a couple of those things. The actions change every drafting round based on the action cards that you have, you've acquired in your hand. And that happens during the drafting round. There's a draft that's part of the first assembly phase, so we'll go through those phases. But the first thing that I want to do is hit the components high level, and then we're going to get into some gameplay mechanics and kind of go through what a turn or a round would look like. So right off the bat, I'm going to get into the rule book. And the rule book is, you know, I, I could only use the word beautiful. I mean, look at the look at the color and the artwork just on the outside of this rule book. I mean, it's just it's awesome. So, so cool. And the, and the whole rule book is, um, and I'll just show you this way, the whole rule book is full text, color, and there's actually not a lot of text that's in there. It's a very quick read. I think it's 11 pages from front to back. There is a two-player variant that's on the very back page, um, and all it does is, is slightly change some of the drafting mechanics and some of the cards that you actually hold in your hand to make it more effective for just two players. And I think the the mechanic changes that they've made in the, the two-player rule variant work very well. So don't shy away from getting this game to just be a two-player game if that's your thing. It still plays excellent as a two-player game. So what I'll do now is give you a flavor for what this game's all about. What's the feel? What's the lore behind the game? And to give it its full justice, I will literally read you an excerpt that they have here in the rule book in the very beginning because I just think this is a this is this is great text. Innis takes place during the height of the ancient Celts, when history and legend are one and the same. Players are chieftains leading their clans beyond the seas from Ireland to a newly discovered island. They settle the land, explore the surrounding area, harvest resources from the mines, and construct citadels and sanctuaries for their protection. Bards recount the tales of their gods and heroes. Druids act as advisors, and master craftsmen immortalize Celtic civilization. So you can see from that intro that this game is going to be super cool. Let's get into the components. The first thing that we've got over here are the actual tiles for the board. And you'll see three of them set out here. They got a real nice white outer border to them, which I, I like that art style that they followed on each one of these tiles. It gives it a really good look once it's all laid out. And what it does... Uh, really well that that other games that have these tiles that strapped together and built on the board sometimes fail to do is it makes it very visually clear 
where each land is. And then on the back of each one of these, it's got some real nice Celtic artwork. Uh, very, you know, well done. Just, you know, and it's something that doesn't necessarily have to be there, right? They didn't have to put a backing. They could have just made the backs of these just your standard black. But they did this, you know, this wonderful Celtic artwork on the back of each one of these tiles as well as on the back of every component that's here, you know, except for your little chits, right? They're just double-sided of whatever that, you know, whatever that piece is. Moving right across here, we're going to find our Territory Advantage cards. And what these do is as you explore new territories, you're going to lay these cards out on the board that correspond to those territories. And whoever is the chieftain, and we'll get into what that means, of that territory, uh, get to actually claim one of these advantage cards and use that card for up to one round. Now, within that one round, they do have to use that advantage card because upon the next round, they're all going to be collected uh, and they'll be redistributed to the people that would be the chieftain in those areas upon that next round, which may be you again. So you may get to claim that card right back. The next here is our epic tail cards. These cards are going to be acquired through various game triggers as you play. And most of the time, these cards, if not all of the time, these cards will be acquired through your action cards that are here, the green cards. These epic tail cards last the entire game until you want to use them. So you can, once you acquire these, you can hang on to those and use them whenever you see fit. The artwork in this game is awesome. I mean, the colors are great. The, the visual's great. The, the actual art style is, is perfect for this, for this style of themed game. Our last card here in the game is our action cards. And what I really like about these cards is when it's your turn, you really can't do anything unless you have an action card in your hand, you'll have four at a time, in your hand that allow you to take that action. So you, if, if you want to move one of your, let's say I was the green player and you wanted to actually settle and say, oh, I'm going to move a clan into the mountains. You couldn't do that unless you have an action card that allows you to do that. These cards will also allow you to place the components that we see here. We've got citadels and we have sanctuaries. And in these cards, you'll find the ability to be able to place these objects. And I'll explain what each of those do here in a second. So if we just take a look at these really quick, and again, I'll flash this artwork up just so you can have a, have a look at some of these cards. And they are oversized cards, so know that. Um, don't go out, if you're going to sleeve these cards, don't go out. These are not going to fit in your standard size sleeves. Uh, these are a much larger card, more like the size of a tarot card, but they're not, they're not really a tarot card, but they are, they are more of that size. Uh, but you can see here, just again, the artwork, just absolutely fantastic. Really, really cool artwork. What you'll find with these action cards is there's only 17 of them in the game. So every round, uh, the Bren, and we'll explain that here in a minute, is going to shuffle those up and take one off the top, set it down. So one of, those, one of the 17 abilities is going to be out of the round for that game. You don't know which one. And then in a four-player game, each person's going to get four cards. So every one of the action cards will be distributed each round in a four-player game. And that mechanic makes it really cool because it means that as you, the more you play this game, you understand all the actions that are going to be in this deck. And you know the ones that you have, and you absolutely know the ones that you don't have. And that becomes very important in the drafting process that's part of the assembly phase. But we'll get there in a second. The next component that we have is this little harp, these little tokens here, and these are called deeds. And they allow you to kind of get a, it's, it's almost like a wild card. They allow you to get a certain type of um, victory condition. If, may, if maybe you're a little short and you aren't able to get that victory condition, you need one of three victory conditions to win the game. And these deeds, as you acquire them, allow you to be able to kind of get a little extra bonus to be able to meet those victory condition uh, cases. This here is the Pretender token. And with this little token with the kind of the, um, almost has a, kind of a... Uh, uh, Game of Thrones crown type look to it. This token allows you to claim victory on the game. So if you're in a position in the game where you've met one or more of the victory conditions, and we'll go over those in a second, you can choose to take one of these tokens at a certain point in the game to say, okay, upon the next round, um, I'm going to have one of these tokens, and if I still have one of the three, I can go for winning the game. Now, there may, might be other players that also will take these tokens and also may meet winning conditions. So every round, you're scoring for who is going to win the game. Now, that will play out over the course of the 60 minutes that's defined here, 
but that could happen much sooner depending on the actions that people take and the way that the game flows. I'm going to jump right up here now and I'm going to take a look at these three tokens that are included. The first is the Bren and it has a picture of kind of a, a head Celtic uh, type leader that's on it. It's a really cool coin. Uh, both sides have the same image there of him. Each turn this is going to be assigned as kind of the main uh, first player token in this game. And how you're going to get this is whoever is the chieftain and has control of the territory on the board that has the capital. The capital is the largest citadel miniature that's included in the game. So whoever is, is taking control and is the chieftain of that area will control the capital. That person is the brim. The next one here we have is a festival token. So the festival token is put out on a territory and actually is put into play versus one of our action cards here. So there's an actual card, and I believe I have it right here on the stack, and I can show you exactly what that does. Here's the festival, and I'll read this. In a territory both where you are present and that has one or more sanctuaries, place one of your clans and the festival token there. A player who initiates a clash in that territory removes one of his clans from there, at the end of the season, remove the festival token. So basically what it does, it's really going to protect you upon any battles, or in this game they call clashes. And the last token that we have here is the Flock of Crows, which is a really nice mechanic, and it's not something that's brand new. We've seen it in other games. But it's a mechanic that allows that every single game round, part of the assembly phase, the brand is going to take this, and that person is going to flip that coin and land on my stomach, and uh, depending on how the coin lands, uh, it's going to give the actual turn order for that round. I always like that when, when you play games and every round the turn order kind of changes. I don't like it as much when it's like, hey, it's me, then it's you, then it's you, then it's you. And it, I don't like it as much when it jumps around like that. But I do really like a mechanic in, in games that actually change the cycle around the table of how the turn order works versus it always just being, hey, I'm the first player, it's always to the left. So I really like that mechanic that they added in, and I like the fact that you get to flip a coin to be able to tell that. So it adds something that's kind of a cool little, uh, cool little bit to the game, and, and I found it to be pretty fun to flip that coin every round to see which way it goes. Everybody kind of watches to see, right? Because it can really make a difference, especially when you're doing your draft. Let's focus our attention now to the beautiful miniatures in this game. Now, I'm going to say that at first look, when I got them out of the box, I thought, you know, these look pretty good. Um, you know, they, they look better than what you would see in a game normally like this, where they really scale down the miniatures. They don't put a lot of detail and sculpting into these, uh, because usually you have a bunch of them, and there's a decent amount in this game. Oh, and I just realized we're missing the blue player. The blue player miniatures aren't out here. Ha, hang on. Ennis, let's get those. There we go. <laughs> oh, man. I love video magic. But the more I... The more I looked at these miniatures and, and really got kind of close on them, they have an incredible amount of sculpting and detail for these little tiny miniatures that are included in this game. Most of the times, and especially where, where it really caught my eye was on, was on some of the capes. Like this character here, which looks like, you know, maybe like a, almost like a rogue kind of character, is carrying a small little dagger. She is wearing a what is like a fur cloak or a fur kind of coat uh, that's hanging off hanging off her back. And when you look at that cloak, it is highly detailed. All the fur is very sculpted. Her hair is very detailed. There's a lot of good sculpting in the hair. The face is actually fully sculpted out. The clothing. So, you know, I really can't wait. And even like on the little, on her boots, you can see the fur at the top, the laces that are sculpted into the front part of the boot. You know, so I can't wait. I'm definitely going to, I'm definitely going to paint these miniatures. I also do painting on on some of my games and some of my miniatures, uh, and I'll post some pictures as I get those done. I particularly like, you know, it's it's kind of hard to say which one I like better because they're both really really cool. I love the way this citadel looks. It's got kind of this sitting on a hill, surrounded with a outer barrier. Um, you know, old school kind of uh, temple based town. And I'll have pictures of these up close here at the end, but just a very, very cool. And it's got one little spot here in the front where you 
can set a clan uh, when there's any type of clash. And when there's a clash, clan members can actually go in and take refuge in citadels, but only a citadel can only hold one clan at a time. And then these here are your sanctuaries. And I really like the way they did the sanctuaries. They got this little entry door. They've got a nice wooden kind of picket fence that goes all the way around it with a little uh, temple in the middle. And they've got some nice trees and some gardens that surround it that are all nicely sculpted in. And I think they've even gotten, you probably could create, which would be really cool, almost kind of like a little water-based river kind of through the middle. Um, so there's all kinds of stuff you could do with these miniatures if you really wanted to get detailed with these you could paint these up put a little grass work in you could put a little clear nail polish with a little blue dye and do yourself a nice little creek or river that runs kind of behind it or, or right in front of it where it's got a little bit of a flat area on the plastic so there's a lot of options that you can do with these if you really want to kind of take it to the next level um, and, uh, and, and detail out and customize your game and then the last component that they've included which actually was really nicely done each player gets your standard kind of cheat sheet about the game. And on one side, it's got the card types as well as some of the symbols on the cards, what they mean, but they're very, very straightforward. I don't know that I would even need these symbols to know what these symbols mean. And then on the other side, it's got the round summary, which indicates both phases of the game, the assembly phase, as well as the season phase and as well as how a clash and a battle would work. Um, I was able to read through this. It's a very quick read. Grab one of these cards, sit down and start playing. It's a very quick setup as well uh, in a short period of time. So again, something else that I think they did really, really well with this style of game is it doesn't come out of the box. It doesn't take 15 to 20 minutes to set up. It doesn't take forever to explain the rules. You can just pop it out, start playing with new players, no problem. It's just that easy and straightforward and well done on the mechanic execution. Okay, let's get into what a game round would look like and what gameplay would feel like. To be able to do that, I'm going to use our handy dandy card here, our reference sheet, and I'm also going to use our rule book to go over the details of what those victory conditions are, how you can actually win the game. The first phase that we're going to go through is called the assembly phase. Within the assembly phase, there are five steps. The first step is the chieftain of the capital becomes the Bryn for that round. So again, remember, that's the person that gets to hold kind of that first player token. Step number two, you're going to check to see if a player has won the game. So how do we do that? When you're in the next phase, which is the season, and that part of the game, you're able to choose a pretender token because you have acquired something that gives you a victory condition. So you're going to have that token. That's step number one. Step number two is you're going to have to have one or more of these three things. The first being, you have to be chieftain over six or more opposing clans. You have to be present in territories with six or more total sanctuaries. Or, present in six or more territories. So any one of those three victory conditions will allow you to win the game. You also have to have this token in hand. Step number three, if there's no winner at that point, each player takes the advantage cards matching the territories where they are chieftain. So wherever you have the most dominance and you are chieftain of a territory, you will take the advantage card that matches that territory. So you'll just pick that deck up, you'll flip through, you'll find, oh, I'm, I'm chieftain, let's say I'm green. Well, I have three here. I'm chieftain in Highlands. So I'm going to go through this deck, I'm going to find Highlands, and now that is my card, and I will have the advantage and the bonus for that territory for the next round. Step number four, the Bren tosses the Flock of Crows token to determine the turn round. And step number five, the Bren shuffles the action cards and then deals four to every player. Now this is a really fun mechanic and it isn't something new that we haven't seen before. Uh, where you're actually gonna get a hand of cards, you're gonna choose a card and then you're gonna pass that deck to the, to the player uh, around, you know, to your left or right. You're gonna pass that deck, then you're gonna get a new deck, you're gonna look through it, oh, okay, you're gonna take a card, you're gonna pass the deck. But it's executed very well for the actions that are on the cards. So I think they did a little bit of a better job with that mechanic because as those cards come around, again, there's only 16 actions that are going to be available in a four-player game, and all 16 of those actions are going to be in play. So as they come around, you're going to be choosing which one you get. So out of your four that you initially have upon that deal, 
you're going to be able to say, okay, for this round, I think my strategy is going to be, you know, X, Y, or Z. So I'm going to pick this card because I know I absolutely want that. And I'm going to pass these three to either my right or my left, depending on which way our flock of crows coin fell. Now at that point, the players are going to then take those cards and choose, okay, the one that they want. And every round it's going to get less and less. So you're going to pass three cards, then you're going to pass two cards, then you're going to pass one card. Hey, on, on the first time I had my cards, I chose this one and I passed three. Well, you just gained three more. Before you pass the cards again, you're going to keep two of them, okay, and pass two. You don't necessarily have to keep the one that you chose in your first round of in your first round of cards. When you get that second batch, you may find that there's two of those that you want, and you pass on the one that you might have kept initially to the player to your right or left. So I just, I love that mechanic that you don't, when you get a card, it isn't like you select one and you lay it down and now you only have this. And it's like, oh man, I wish I wouldn't have kept that one out because these are awesome and that player may not have one of them for one reason or the other. All right, each player can do one of the three things that follows here upon their turn. One, they can play a season card, uh, which is your action cards here, or uh, an epic card if you have that and you want to play it. Two, Take a pretender marker. So if at that point you've determined, again, we have one of our three or more of one of our three victory conditions, we can pick up a pretender marker and say, okay, I'm ready to win it on the next round. Or two, they can pass, which means they just don't want to do anything. And that generally isn't going to happen until uh, near later uh, turns. And basically the round is over when all four players, again, we've set up for a four-player game here, all four players have passed consecutively. Now, the last component of this game is going to be clashes. Now, again, you're going to be moving throughout the game through various territories, and all of those actions that you're able to do are going to be driven from your action cards. But as you do that, you're going to run into what they call clashes, which are our battles. And you don't have to clash. This is something that is executed by an attacker. So they choose to do that action. There is no such thing as, okay... There's three green here, and I'm white, and I play a, a action card that allows me to move into another territory with maybe one of my current uh, members that are, my clan members that are on the board. Or uh, maybe I have uh, a clan over here that's in my reserve that I want to move into the board. But let's just say for one reason or the other, I want to move this uh, clan uh, miniature here into the Highlands where I have three and I am chieftain, the green player is in the Highlands, that doesn't execute a clash. What executes a clash is if I was to move in there and then on a later turn, I was to play an action card that said, I'm now going to attack you and be the attacker or the instigator as they call it in this game. When it's the green player's turn, the green player can be the instigator and attack. And I'll also say that it doesn't matter if you have three to one, one to three, that bears no difference. So if a clash started, the first thing that we're gonna to wanna to do is everyone in turn order, um, starting after the attacker or the instigator, is going to choose to take refuge in a citadel if they choose to. And what that allows them to do is they're protected for that round. So in this situation, let's say the green player wanted to do an attack upon the white player. The white player could immediately say, well, I'm just gonna take refuge here in this citadel and there would be no attack. You're going to have multiple citadels, multiple sanctuaries within each area, and there is no limit to how many can be. You could have everyone in the game in one spot, okay? There's no limit to how many citadels or sanctuaries can be in a territory. So when there's battles and clashes, people are going to jump into those citadels, but again, a citadel can only hold one person. So as it goes around the table, if there's only one citadel, and let's say there's multiple, you know, clan colors, colors here, well, you know, one one clan may jump into this citadel and another clan may jump into this citadel. Well, there's none left. So guess what? The orange player has to be part of that clash that the attacker is initiating in that territory. Now, there's two other things you can actually do as part of a clash. You can withdraw. So let's say in a surrounding adjacent territory, you are a chieftain. And that is the, that is the key to this withdrawal move. You have to be a chieftain in one of the surrounding areas to be able to withdraw from a clash, and you will withdraw your clan miniature off of that territory, and you will place it in an adjacent territory where you are a chieftain. So really that just kind of removes you from the battle and keeps your uh, clan miniature safe on the board. 
The third thing you can do is just execute a maneuver. And we talked about that a little bit earlier when we talked about the attack move. You can execute a maneuver, which is one of your epic tail cards that, again, you can acquire through the game uh, based on certain actions, and those last from round to round. Now, you're going to go, and clashes will essentially last as long as till all the players that still have a standing member within that territory say, okay, I'm done. Let's just end the war. We each have one person left. Let's just go ahead and end. And everybody has to agree to that. If it does not, it literally will go until it's pretty much last man standing. And that's it. That's the game. You're going to go through those two phases, assembly and then season, and you're going to go round and round the table until you get one person who's able to get that pretender token and one of three of the victory conditions, if not more than one of the victory conditions, and take the win. And you're going to find multiple situations where there'll be multiple people that are going to have these tokens and might have one, if not two, of the victory conditions the longer the game goes on. That's what I really like about it. Early in the game, you're going to have that person or two that's going to pop up and be like, oh, I got one of the victory conditions. Bam, during the season phase, I'm going to take one of those pretender tokens and next round, better watch out because I might be able to win the game if... I have this and I still have a victory condition when we get to the next when we get to the beginning of the next round. Now, the further the game goes on, upon every round you're going to have multiple people that are going to be picking up these pretender tokens that are going to be fighting for that win upon the next round. So then it becomes more of most people around the table have a pretender token and now you're just trying to knock down and have clashes and half battles to get the other players out of the position of having the victory for that round. And that's when the game really starts to get interesting and really starts to get fun. And it almost kind of feels like it has end game to it and not just you're playing the same thing over and over and over until multiple rounds until, oh, okay, it's done. I finally acquired the, the mo more victory points than everybody else. The game really gives you that end game feel. This is Ennis. It is a phenomenal game. I cannot recommend it more. Again, this is not going to be in retail for a few months. When it comes out, hit up your retail channels of wherever you want to get the game. I get all my stuff from CoolStuffInc.com. I just find that their prices are really good and they've got a wide selection. So that's generally where I go to get my stuff if I if I do purchase it online. Again, this copy came from our friends at Asmodee. And I couldn't be happier with this game. It is absolutely everything that I wanted it to be. And it executes on all levels, in my opinion. Click that like below. Hit the subscribe to join. This has been the McGuire Review, and I'll see you next time. is a phenomenal game. Is that a spider? <laughs> may initiate a clash in a territory and you may choose one player who is present to be the instigator. Dig it. Instigator. Oh my god. Instigator. Did I say that right? The dag. The dagda. The dogda. The dogda. So this one here, the dogda. Ah!